Okay, this is actually one standard IS-19 employee benefit. Uh, it's a very complex standard and very important as well. But from, from SEC exam point of view, actually it's very important, but not complex because the standard actually is really difficult and complex and lengthy. But what they have included in SEC as part of the syllabus, that is rather easy part of the standard. And actually this is one of the standards which is not being implemented by many companies. Like, you know, I always say that if I ask some company, I'll talk about mid-sized companies that, do you follow IFRS? They say, yes, we follow IFRS. But then when I ask them, do you follow this thing in IFRS? So say, no, this I do not. So I can say that a lot of companies, there are very few, very large companies are following IFRS 100%. But then many, many other are following 80%, some are following 85% or something like this. 10, 15% they are skipping. It is just like if somebody is Muslim and you ask him, what is your religion? He say, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim. And then you say, do you do all these things which are given in the religion? And they say, no, this I do, this I do, this I don't. Similarly, if I ask someone, what is your religion? And they say, I'm a Christian. So the, the, rule, the, the, the rule book, the Christian rule book, the Bible says to do all these things. Do you follow all of them? And he says, you know, this one I do, this one I do, but these I don't do. So we all are half Muslims, half Christians and half IFRS. And this is one of the areas, employee benefit, which is missing with many companies. I'll give you an example. I'll start with an example and you would realize where I'm coming from. Um, I mean, we all have, uh, when we work in companies, we have employees. And when we have employees, um, we have some vacations and leaves which are pending, you know, unused vacations, unused vacations, and unused vacations or leaves, they are a liability. Okay. Now, if I ask you, go back to your office and work and see in your accounting books, how many of you? are recording the leave liability. I'm not saying lease liability. I'm saying the leave liability in your books. Hardly, hardly. A lot of people, you will come back and say, you know, we have given vacations and given vacations, but whatever are the unused vacations? Actually, unused. our company do some uh, provisions for them. So some some companies they do, and some come and 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 many companies they do not do, but actually they should you should be doing it. But this is one area where many companies they fail. And I said, especially the mid-size entities, they don't calculate. Either they do not calculate, or even if they calculate, they probably do not calculate it correctly. Anyways, uh, this standard IS 19 employee benefit. Uh, it is about the benefits which are given to employees short term and long term. Short term benefits are like salaries, bonuses, medical, whatever you give them. Short term are those benefits which are given during the year. Short term benefits are given during the year. And with short term benefits, there is no complexity. They are straightforward because you pay them during the year, whatever you have not paid, you record it in the books as your current liability, you debit to the PNL and you credit to the liability and so on. And short-term benefit is not the scope for exam purposes. What we discuss in it for exam purposes, we talk about the long-term benefits. Long-term benefits, which are most commonly, we call them post-employment benefits. Post-employment benefit, okay? Uh, Post-employment benefits could be uh, like pensions, gratuities, or something else. And long-term benefits, they are actually very complicated because these are those benefits which you will start giving employee after post-employment, maybe after 10, 20 years. And the calculation of these benefits, it's really is a complicated issue and which is done by another professionals, which are called actuaries. 
So actuaries, these are, I mean, actuary or actuaries, these are another group of finance professionals, which is a combination of economics and finance. It's a different qualification, actually. These are not accounting people. These are not finance people. We call them like lawyers, doctors, accountants, actuaries. And they will make these estimates because they need to consider, you know, uh, economy into it, economic conditions, growth rates, demographics, age of the people. For example, one of the post-employment benefit is pension. You tell someone that you would retire at the age of 65, which is a very actually disputed point. Let's suppose it's 62. You would retire at the age of 62. This is what is happening currently in France because they want to increase the age of retirement. So let's suppose you are saying to someone you will retire at 65 and then you will get monthly pension for the rest of your life. And when we say for the rest of your life, it means that as long as you live and how much, how, how many years you would live after 65. So sometimes you have, you know, uh, you need to see the average life expectancy. So in some countries, 75 years is the average life. In some countries, 72, maybe in some other countries, 79. And these estimates, they keep on changing. And then the, you know, the economic conditions and the growth in that pensions and et cetera. So it's quite a lot of challenging work. We as accountants are not responsible to calculate those benefits. Our, our standard IS-19 is does not teach us how to calculate. What we are focusing at is how to record it. Same goes with IFRS-9. Remember IFRS-9 financial instruments and you say impairment of financial assets or expected credit losses. So the standard does not teach you how to calculate credit losses or the standard does not teach you how to calculate the impairment. You calculate your quality of credits and the credit losses and impairment through your own banking softwares. So there are different softwares, different programs. They will calculate the amount of the loss. Your job is only to show it in the, in the books. So you just, you don't calculate it. You only do the accounting treatment. The same happens here. The actuaries will calculate the numbers for us. And our job is only to report them or record them correctly. So long-term benefits could be very complicated. Like I said that post-employment benefit, one of them is pensions, uh, which could become a complicated issue. So number one, what I want to say that if I talk about IAS 19, IAS 19 discusses the short-term benefits and the long-term benefits, which are called post-employment benefits. So for us, short term is not the issue. We will be focusing on post-employment. And within post-employment, there are two types of benefit. We call them defined benefit plan, defined benefit, and we call it defined contribution. defined contribution plan. And so we said that we are not interested in short term. We will only talk about post-employment, which is long term. And within long term, we are also not interested in defined contribution. So our focus will only remain on defined benefit plan. So the scope of the standard with respect to your exam or syllabus is restricted only to defined benefit plan. Now, you need to understand what is defined contribution and what is the difference between defined contribution and what is the uh, and defined benefit. So what happens in certain cases? <clears throat> so for post-employment benefits, companies, they actually uh, make some contributions. So what happens that we bring in some employee and we say that if you work for us for the next 20 years, 
So during the period, these 20 years, we will give you salary, bonus, transportation, medical, children education. These are all, all are short term. But then we also promise the employee that we will give you something once you leave with us, once you leave the company, this part, which is called the post-employment benefit. Now, the question is that what are we going to give them? And how do we give them? So generally what ha happens that contributions are made. Contributions are made by the employer and contributions are made by the employee. So we tell the employee that you give $50 every month and we give $50. So we take out $50 from their salary every month and we company puts $50. So $100 is invested in some pension plan or in some pension fund, in some investment fund, $100 will be invested on behalf of this employee every month for the next 20 years. So this amount is getting accumulated. So every month you put 50, we as employer also contribute 50, $100 goes to a pension fund in your name, and end of the year, end of the term, when the 20 years period will finish, you will receive the total investment, whatever it has become at that time. So you will be, you will be getting these benefits. So if I say defined contribution, under defined contribution plan, what happens that the contribution is defined, which means you put 50 and we put 50, then you put 50 and then we put 50. And how much are you going to get at the end of the period is unknown. If the pension fund or the investment fund is doing great, is doing good, you will get more money. If that pension fund has not really done very well, you might be getting less money. But whatever will be there, it will be yours. So we are not promising what you will get. We are actually defining the contribution. That we will give $50, you will put $50, and whatever will be the outcome, whether more or less, it will be yours. So the benefit is not defined. You ask me, how much is the benefit? I say benefit is not defined. Contribution is defined. And this actually, the, the, the entity, the company is under no obligation. And the company does not need to do some specific long accounting adjustments for that because the company is not promising anything. We have taken out $50. We took 50 from your salary. I put 50 on the top and I invest there. My job is done. Now, if it is doing good or bad, that's another scenario. This is called defined contribution plan and defined contribution plan is not the focus of your exam. And we will not be doing any question on that and we will not be spending any more time on this. What is important for us is defined benefit plan. This is what we actually are, um, the scope of our IS-19 with reference to exam purposes, defined benefit. In defined benefit, what happens that we define the benefit that you will get 200K in 21st year or whatever. We have actually defined the benefit as a company. So we ask some employee that you put 50 and we put 50, and then this continues for another 20 years. And when you will, in, when you will get retired in post-employment benefits, you will receive 200K. So we are defining the benefit. We have defined the benefit, which means that this becomes our liability. Before I said, I don't know if it is good, if it is bad, if it will be more, if it will be less, it will be yours. I'm not bothered with that as an as organization because so I'm not taking any responsibility or liability of that thing. 
But in defined benefit plan, I agree with my employees that you will get 200. And what will happen? And based on our initial judgment, we thought that if you put 50, we put 50 for the next 20 years and the plan grows at 8% or the plan grows at 7%, ultimately it will become 200K. And that's why I gave you the number 200K. So I said, you put 50, I put 50, and I know that economy will grow or the fund will grow at 8% per annum. So in 20 years, ultimately it will be 200. But then what happens? In year one, I give 50, and you give 50, year two, I give 50, you give 50. But then in year three, what happens? You give 50. But then I see that the market growth has gone down to 6%. And if it is at 6%, $50 are not enough. $50 are not enough to make it 200. So I need to start contributing $90. Now you put 50, I give 90. So my contribution changes because I need to reach the number. I cannot ask you to give more. You will keep on giving 50. We as an organization have to put more money. But then we see that the market is doing very good. So it is possible that next year you give 50 and we give nothing. Because we already have accumulated enough funds to meet the liabilities. So what is happening that these numbers these numbers are our assets, which we have made the contribution. And this is what we have the liability, which we have to pay. So if we see that assets are already enough to meet the obligations, the liabilities, we stop contributing. But then next year we say, okay, now we need to contribute 30. So this is called defined benefit plan. The focus is on defined benefit plan. In defined benefit plan, what will happen that you have what the terminologies, which you definition, the word, the, uh, the vocabulary, which you will be using is called plan liabilities. And you have plan assets. Plan liabilities are those which you have to pay at the end of the period. Plan assets are those contributions which you already have made. And we use the present value of plan liability because the liability has to be paid in some time in future. So we use the present value of plan liability and we calculate it by discounting the liability with the available discount rate. And for plan assets, they have the market value because we have invested them in some funds, some investment fund. And these investment funds, they have a market value. For that, we use the fair value. So you will be seeing these two terminologies, present value of plan liability and fair value. I'm not saying future value, fair value of plan assets. It is possible that your present value of plan liabilities is 3 million. And the fair value of plan asset is 2.8 million. So it means that 200,000 is short. And this is the amount which you need to add to your plan assets. And this will be charged to the PL as an expense. This will be charged to PL as an expense because at any point in time, you need to make your assets liabilities equal. Now, this is one uh, terminology. Then you have the word which is called service cost. Service cost and you will have a word which is called contributions. And you might have uh, word payments. So I'm just making you familiar with these terminologies so that when you start reading the chapter or you start watching the video lectures, it will be helpful. See, what is the service cost? Now, you people know, uh, I mean, all of you guys are working accountants. I believe so. 
if not all of them, at least most of you people are working accountants. Uh, what you give to your staff, one thing is called salary. So you transfer $2,000 to someone's account, which is their salary, which is net of taxes, after taxes. So if my salary, salaries, expense per month is 2 million, is 2 million. Do you think that my staff cost is 2 million? Can I call it staff cost 2 million? What is salaries are those which the employees have taken. Staff cost includes many other things. For example, I give you 1000, but actually uh, I paid some social security for you 300. I paid insurance for you for 200. So these, if you ask me how much is the salary, I will say 1000. You will come and say, my salary is 1000. But I would say that for me, your cost is 1500. So my staff cost is 1500. Your salary is only 1000. You say, I, I got $1,000. I say, but I spent 1500. Just a very quick question to you people. Just a very rough estimate. For any particular company, now, of course, you can't have one fixed number because insurance and social security payments, training cost, medical costs, and others and others are there. If on average, I'm just speaking, I'm not going to a very strict number. On average, if any company has a salaries, paid salaries of 2 million, what do you think? How much is usually going to PNL under staff cost? Just a number. It, it, it should be more. With it should be more than two million. But how much it should be? Anyone gives some number, please? Four million. Huh? Four. Four. Uh, who said this? Four million approximately. Who said it? Me, Fahim. Okay. Anyone else, please? Three million. Three million. So do you have some statistics in your mind? Some formulas or some benchmarks? In many cases, actually, uh, in many cases, because we understand that if this is net, it is just like if I ask you that if you have a chicken, a live chicken, a live chicken you weigh and it weighs two kilogram, but when you cut it and you take meat out of that chicken, how much do you get? So those people who are into the poultry business, they would say that a two kilogram chicken net meat, you will get say 1.4 kilogram, 600 grams or 30% is waste. It will go into cleaning of that chicken and the wings and whatever, whatever. So. A two kilogram chicken, you can take out meat 1.4. So we have some kind of standards in mind. The same happens with us with when we do accounting or consulting. So we say that, okay, if you are in this industry, retail business, and if your turnover is 300 million, this much of number of employees you should have. If you are having more employees, then you are overstaffed. If you have this much of purchase budget, your procurement staff should be this much or your procurement budget should be this much. So these are just some rough estimate. In most countries, it is lowest as 1.49, and it goes up to approximately two. Approximately two, depending on which country you are located and what type of benefits are given to the staff. But generally, if it is two million, so it has to be between 1.49 on the lower side and two on the higher side, which means it could go up to as high as 4 million. So a staff member comes in and says, I get only 1,000. You get 1,000, but actually you cost me 2,000. Because 1,000 I'm giving you cash, another 1,000 I'm giving on behalf of your, by the way, you should remember that everybody get 30 days vacation. So you work for 11 months, but you get paid for 12 months. So 8% you get extra from there. 
So 8% extra cost goes to me when you are not working for one month. So 11 months work and 12 months salary. And then there are training days when you went on corporate trainings, you did not work and you took some leave and vacation, which were paid. Then there were uniforms. Then there were insurance costs, social securities there, uh, you know, many, many, many other. So it goes up to 1.49 to 2. Anyways, what happens? Uh, my question here is, I come back to the point. When I said to you that you will get, we have this plan assets, 3,000, liability 3 million, assets 2.8 million, a difference of 200, and this should be taken to p &L. Now, why do we take it to p &L? Why is it our cost? You know what happens, I tell you. See, when you came to me, I asked you that how much salary do you expect? And you say, you know, I am an accountant with five years of working experience and five years of working experience accountant, market value is $2,500. So this is what I expect from you, $2,500. And we say that, you know, we do not give you 2,500. We only offer you 2,200. And you say 2,200 is not something which I'm looking for. It is less than the market value. I'm not interested. I say, wait a minute. It's not 2,200. If you join our company, you will also get some post-employment benefits. And you got interested and you say, oh, how much, what are those post-employment benefits? I didn't know that. I say, if you work with us after some period, you will get this much of money. So we have these post-employment benefits, which the other company who is offering you to 2,500, are they giving you post-employment benefit? You said, no, they are not giving. They are giving me just salary and that's all. I say, we are going to give you this thing. So you say, okay, if there are post-employment benefits, I'm fine, I will work. So essentially what happened that when you came to us, we gave you after first month salary and we said debit salaries expense, which is 2,200. And we said credit cash, which is 2,200, which we agreed with you. Now, what happens that employees, companies, they buy goods and services. They buy services from outsiders and they buy services from insiders. Insiders means employees. You, as employees, you also sell services. The only difference is that from outsiders, we buy them on, as a variable cost whenever we need it. From employees, we pay them on the regular basis as per month. So the value of your services was actually 2,500. The cost of your services was 2,500. But you agree at 22 because you were looking for some post-employment benefits. So when we take this cost to our income statement as 2200, this is not the true reflection of the cost of services purchased. Services are understated, which means expenses are understated and profit is overstated. In this, agree in this deal with you, we have actually understate our expense and overstated our profit, number one, which is against the conservatism prudence concept. You cannot overstate the profit. And another thing was happening that we do commit some liability of 300, which we are not showing in the books, but we do have a liability. And after some time period, you will come and say, give me my 300 or give me my benefit, whatever it was. So, before that, actually, until this IS-19 standard was not there, many companies before IS-19, they were only recording this transaction as this part. And there was no provision created for post-employment benefits and the expenses were shown as 2,200. And actually, you know that you do have uh, IFRS, you have US gap, you have Indian gap, Turkish national standards are different, Russian national standards are different, Mexican standards are different. You don't have only two accounting systems in the world. 
two are the most popular ones, US GAAP and IFRS. But there are more than 25 different types of accounting standards working in different regions. And this, stand, this IS-19 employee benefit is missing in most of the other standards. Not many other countries, they are taking considering it. It is a very specific topic of IFRS, uh, IS-19. It is a very specific topic to the set of uh, international accounting standards. Other standards are ignoring, still ignoring. Even IES standards were ignoring it before IS-19 came in. Before IS-19, even if you were following the international accounting standards, you were treating as 2200. So what we understand that your income statement is, your profit is overstated by 300 and your liabilities are understated by 300. So when they say that this was actually the staff cost, this 300, which you are not giving you, it should be charged to the staff cost. So I should actually, what I should say, the correct double entry in this situation, the correct double entry in this situation should have been like this, debit, staff salaries, not by 2200. Actually, debit, I should not say salaries expense. The proper word here is debit staff cost. 2500. Cash, I'm giving you 2200. And credit, you know, staff cost, staff liability, staff cost liabilities, which is 300. So this 300 should be booked in the incomes in the balance sheet. And in the income statement, you should reflect the true cost of the services received. So the standard, it says that as the benefit, as the, as the, you know, the staff, they uh, deliver the services, and the company has used those services and the company has benefited those services. Therefore, the cost of those services should be recorded. Even though it has not been paid or even though it is not payable in the near future. So that staff cost, actually, it goes into your non-current liabilities. It goes into your non-current liabilities. So you are not actually... Uh, the value of services which you are using is not 2200, it is 2500. So uh, because it will overstate your profit. Let's suppose this employee has delivered some job and that job has given a revenue of $5,000. He was a, so this is a consultant, uh, an auditor. He worked on a particular project. He worked on a particular client and that project earned a revenue of 5,000. And then I say that my cost of delivering this thing is 2,200. So I'm saying that my profit is 2,800 from this job, which is wrong because the cost of delivering this service was 2,500 and the profit should be 2,500. If I do not do it, overstatement of profit will happen. So the idea behind that is that although you will pay it in the future, but the employee becomes entitled as they have delivered the services. If they have delivered services in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five and onward, they become entitled to some additional amount which you have promised to pay them at, as post-employment benefit. And therefore it should be charged to the PNL as a staff cost and it should be taken to the other uh, to this to the balance sheet. So what we understand that in this particular case, in our PNL, what we get, we get that uh, you know service cost. We call it service cost. The word which I said, the terminologies which we need to learn. One of the word is service cost. So service cost is that additional three hundred, if you remember. The 300 which was missing, we call it here service cost, the vocabulary which you will use. And that will go to PNL. And this is our expense. Okay. But there is one more thing which will happen. So this is one of the costs. And this is the real cost. This is the result of 
retaining that 300 with me, not paying you full, because I somehow, you know, kind of uh, attract you that I will give you post-employment benefit and we say, okay, then I will take 2,200. And you say, I'll leave this 300 for the later period. Otherwise you are asking 25. So it should go to PNL. The second thing is, if you remember, I told you that you have present value of plan assets or plan liabilities. You have present value of plan liabilities, which was 2.5 million in the beginning of the year. And you have fair value of plan assets, which was 2.5 million at the beginning of the year. So it was equal at the beginning of the year. But then what happens that as the end of the year comes in, end of the year comes in, for some reason, because of the market growth rate, changes in the growth, of liabilities and assets, for some reason, that this becomes 3,000 and this becomes 2,800. So there is a disparity which has come in. So this 200 now is an additional cost to you because you know that increase in liability, liabilities have increased. If they remain 2,800, 2,800, I am fine. There is no problem with me. But I know that the measurement of liabilities and assets will bring some disparity into the numbers. And this disparity, this number is also my cost. So I do have, I call them actuarial adjustments. These are because of some actuarial adjustments, actuarial estimates. So I call my actuarial adjustment. How much is that? 200. And what is it? It is my expense. And where I will show it, I will show it in OCI. It will not go to PNL. Now, this is something, an important point to remember, because this will happen when in exam, they will give you that opening liabilities are this much, closing liabilities are this much, service cost is this much, and etc. So show the accounting treatment. So remember that the service cost is an item of PNL, profit and loss. And the actuarial adjustments, they do not go to PNL. They will be shown in OCI. Why they are shown in OCI? Because these are estimates and these are unrealized. In any case, I am not going to settle them today. I'm not going to pay someone 3 million or I'm not going to receive 2.8 million. It is unrealized and therefore it remains in OCI. And it is quite possible. It is quite possible. And I don't take into PNL because it is possible that next year, next year, maybe this, this from 3 million, this will go to 3.2 million. And somehow my assets will grow to 3.5 million. And that becomes a favorable thing. When assets will increase, asset become more than liability, I have a gain. I don't have a loss. So then you don't have actuarial, here I call it actuarial loss. And then in this situation, you will have actuarial gain. So you will again adjust actuarial gain into OCI. So these numbers, you are not giving them out someone. So don't show them in PNL. Keep them in OCI. Sometime liabilities go up when you have actuarial loss. It goes as a loss in OCI. Sometime you have actuarial gains. So they are moving regularly throughout. Okay. So we understand one word that what is service cost? I explained you that $300 is the service cost and service cost goes to PNL. Then you will have, you might have another type of adjustment, which is called actuarial gains and losses, which are the difference in the measurement of fair value of assets and present value of liability. And they go to OCI, other comprehensive income. Any question until here? Yes, please. Any question? I've shared this shared this Excel file. Uh, a very typical exam question. What type of question it comes in exam? They will tell you that you have your opening balance. I'm just creating a very a typical format for exam question. So you have opening balance. Opening balance of what? You have opening balance. You call it you know, fair value of assets. 
plan assets and you have present value of plan liabilities, okay? So opening balance of, um, so fair value of plan assets, which I said that you might have in the beginning, 3000 here and okay, 2800 of assets, 3000 of liabilities. And then these two columns you will build up with which type of things? One is called service cost. One will be called as contributions. Contributions. Then you say interest or growth on liabilities and interest and growth on assets. And then you might have uh, uh, payments, plan payments to members. So what will happen? They will tell you that a company Alpha A at the beginning on 1st January 2006, they have opening balance of plan assets 28, 2.8 million. Present value of plan liability was 3 million. During the year, the service cost or the past service cost, let's call it that service cost is 500. So this service cost will be added to the liabilities because you would say debit staff cost, credit staff liabilities. So service cost is added to the liabilities. Then they will tell you that during the year, the company made contributions for 400 or let's call it 600. So that contribution will be added to the asset side because whenever you make contribution, it goes and adds up to the assets. Then they will tell you that interest on liabilities is 5% and interest on asset or growth of asset is 4%. So which means that whatever are your plan liabilities, they are increasing by 5% and the assets are increasing by 4%. And you will always, always, always make 5% growth on the opening balance, which means 3 million into 5%. And here, which means 2.8 million into 4%. So this number comes in and then says plan payments to members because some of the members, they got retired and we paid them. So when you paid them, the liabilities were reduced. At the same time, assets were also reduced. So plan payments are reduced from the both sides. And then you make a total, how much it looks like the as per your balance sheet. So this is the number, which is your balance sheet values. These are your now statement of financial position values that according to statement of financial position, you should have this much, 3.3162 on assets and 3300 on liabilities. But then it says, but then it says to you that fair value at 31st at 31st of December, whatever is their financial date. Fair value is 3200 here and 3500 here. So, because this is something which has to be measured at fair value, these are the book values. So, you started with the opening balances, opening fair values, and then you add, subtract plan assets, service cost, etc. And you said that in my books, the value is. 3162 on assets and 3300 on liabilities. But let me see how much are these in the market. And market is this much. So this is, now I calculate 3200. So this is 3800. And that is what I say, gain on assets. So gain on assets. And then I say, okay, let's calculate what happened with liabilities there is a loss on liability. So you have gain on asset and you have loss on liabilities. See, because asset instead of 31, 3162, market value is 3200, assets have increased. That's a good sign. I call it gain on asset. 
But then I see liabilities in my books should be 3,300, but market says 3,500. So liabilities have grown, have, have grown, which means that it is a loss. So, and then I call them actually, I should call them actuarial gain or loss. So how much is the total gain or total loss? The net of them, if I say 200 minus 38. So you actually have made a loss of 162 because 200 is a loss on liability, 38 is gain on asset, the net result is 162. This 162 should go to OCI. So this number 162 goes to your other comprehensive income as your loss. You will record it. And then what goes to income statement? You see that you have interest here. This is your interest income. This is your interest expense. So these two number, they are the net of them. The net of this thing will go as your finance cost. If I see how much is your finance cost, that would be 150 minus 112. So 38 is your finance cost. And then this one service cost of 500. This is your service cost. And that goes to, so this goes to my PNL and this goes to my PNL, okay? As expense, as expense. So if I ask you that under this given scenario, what goes to PNL? You will say that, how much is that number? Service cost 500, I think. Yeah. So I take this number also here. And so I would say that 500 in the PNL, this number comes and 38. So 538 will go to PNL as a net number. 538. This will go to PNL. And 162 will go to my OCI. If this is the if these are the numbers, if this is the scenario, 538 to PNL, 162 to OCI. This is the impact. So this type of question you will receive an exam uh, where they will say that this is the opening liability, opening asset, service cost, and nothing else will come. Nothing else will come. These line items which I mentioned to you, there is some, uh, uh, there are some other things which we call them curtailment that you will listen the lecture. I have discussed the curtailment and remeasurement. The two issues which I did not uh, touch today, and they actually do not require a lot of explanation. You can listen to my 15 minute lecture for curtailment and 15 minute lecture for remeasurement and your topic is complete. There is nothing else which can come into exam and it's not very complicated question. If you uh, go through the lecture carefully, then exam question would be very easy because this is one of the standards which does, which standard itself is very complicated, but from exam point of view, it is the, one of the easiest ones, easiest one. Any question you want to ask, please ask. Uh, sir, what about current service cost? This is actually uh, the service cost, which we are taking 500. This is service cost could be current, could be past. In any case, it it's goes the to the income statement. Okay. Past and there's something, actually, uh, past there's something cost, called... Past service cost is actually remeasurement of the past service cost. Okay. Yes. What about uh, asset ceiling or something it's called? Um, that I discussed in, in curtailment lecture. Okay.